Hello and welcome to video 5 for week 6. In this video I'm going to do some proofs with some of the material from this week from linear transformations in the matrix action. Now I could do proofs of some very general properties. There are very, some very important properties that I stated that I didn't give proofs for. The fact that the matrix action is linear, the fact that all linear transformations have a matrix representation, that connection, so that any linear transformation is the same as a matrix action. It's a very important connection. We could try and prove it in full generality. We could also prove some of the properties of matrix multiplication, like multiplying with the identity matrix on the left or the right. It doesn't do anything to a matrix A, or the associativity of the matrix multiplication, that we can bracket the matrix multiplication as we wish. I've chosen not to do any of these more general proofs. These are all important things, and at some level someone does need to prove these so that we can use linear algebra. The reason I've chosen not to do these proofs is there are they are all notationally very, very difficult to do them in full generality. We have to have a lot of matrices with numbers and indices. And conceptually, they're not terribly difficult. They're just notationally a challenge. So I've chosen to focus on some more specific, more focused proofs later in the video. This does bring up a point that one of the major challenges to writing mathematics and doing proofs is notation. In some instances, notation is the biggest barrier to writing a decent proof, keeping track of all of your symbols and knowing what they mean. Even in the proofs this week, you'll see that the notation gets a little bit complicated, and keeping track of all the symbols and what they mean can be a challenge, even in the more specific proofs I'm going to do. So I want to prove two specific propositions about the examples we did in R2, the five types of transformation in R2. And I want to prove that any two rotations in R2 commute. We said that the general matrix multiplication is not commutative, that we can't interchange the order. It happens to be true that for specifically rotations in R2, we can interchange the order, and your two rotations will commute. I also want to prove that the composition of a projection with itself is just the same projection. So a projection was flattening R2 onto some line. And if I do it twice, the composition of projection with itself, well, I flatten R2 onto some line, and then I flatten it again onto the, onto the same line. Well, it's already flattened onto the line. The second projection shouldn't really do anything. So it makes sense that if I compose a projection with itself, I just get the original projection. Doing it once and doing it twice is the same thing. So I want to prove both these statements. All right, how do I prove that rotations commute? Well, I said I wanted to prove this in full generality. Any two rotations commute. A any rotation is given by some angle counterclockwise measured from the positive x-axis. Um, so I can write my two rotations as A and B with angle theta and phi. And then if I want to prove they commute, I want to look at the matrix multiplication. I want to do it with A first, I want to do it with B first, and I want to see that I get the same outcome. So let me do A times B first. In terms of transformations, this is doing B first because in composition, the thing on the right happens first. So this is doing the rotation B and then the rotation A, seeing what we get. So we do the matrix multiplication here. We go across the first row and down the first column. That gives us cosine times cosine, which is there, and sine times sine, which is there. That gives us the first term. And likewise, I will do the second term, the third term, the fourth term, using the matrix multiplication going across the rows of the first matrix and down the columns of the second matrix. And I get this complicated matrix with four entries. Each entry is a sum and a, and a product of various cosines and sines of, th of phi and theta. But it's what it is, so this, this will be the form that we have for A times B. Let's do it the other way. Let's do B times A. So here I write the phi matrix on the left, the theta matrix on the right, uh, switch from before. In terms of composition, this means that A happens first. I do the same thing. I do across the first matrix down the second. So cosine times cosine gives me the cosine here. Sine times sine gives me the sine here. So this is the first term of the matrix multiplication. I get the second term. I get the third term. I get the fourth term for matrix multiplication. And this already looks similar in form to what was on the previous slide. What I need to do is I need to interchange the order of all the multiplications. So here I've got cos phi, or, yeah, cos phi and cos theta. Oh, I can interchange the order of multiplications, write them as cos theta, cos phi, to so write the thetas first. And in some of the, these, I'm also going to interchange the order of the subtraction and addition. 
So I'm just basically going to rearrange using the rules of ordinary number arithmetic, uh, interchanging the orders of, of some additions and some multiplications. And then it turns out that this thing is exactly the same as this thing. So what I've proved is that after doing the rotations in either direction, up to some rearrangements of numbers that are all valid, I get the same outputs, and I can conclude that rotations indeed commute. Now I want to mention one thing here. Um, at some level, what I'm proving is this equation of matrix multiplication. And what I've done here is I've taken this and calculated it, and taken this and calculated it, and shown that we end up with the same thing. And this seems to contradict what I said before, that where I said that if you want to prove an equality, you should start from the left and end up on the right, and not reduce them both to the same thing. So am I contradicting myself? What's going on here? Well, I'm not really because of how the proposition is stated. The proposition states that rotations commute. That means if I do the rotations in either order, I get the same output. So really, I am saying, well, do it in this order, see what the output is. Do it in this order, see what the output is. And then those two outputs are equal. So in this case, because of the statement of the proposition, do this thing, do this thing, check that both outputs are the same, it makes sense to have this structure. Still, in general, if I'm trying to prove an equality, I want to avoid this structure because we still have the problem of reducing to something that's equal when the originals were not equal with things like multiplication by zero. So do still be careful, but there are places in which we can have a proof that sort of looks like this structure based on how it's stated. Lastly, I said that the composition of, two, of a projection with itself gives the original projection. So let me look at the general form of the projection. So if A is a projection in R2 in some direction, so this is in the direction of the vector AB, where AB is a unit vector, and that's important. When we defined the standard form for projections, we said we wanted to choose a unit direction, and that makes sense. Uh, that means if, that, if our vector AB is here, then this is a vector of length one, and it defines a line, and then we're projecting everything in R2, collapsing it to that line. So any direction defines a line, and any line defines a projection. And since we can choose any direction on this line, we might as well choose the direction of length one. So we have a direction of length one. Um, to prove that the composition of a projection is just the original project projection, all I have to do is calculate A squared and show that this is equal to the original matrix A. So I just have to compose it with itself and show that the second thing really doesn't accomplish anything. Now this is a bunch of symbols, but all I'm doing here is the matrix multiplication. I'm going across and down. So I get A squared times A squared, which is here, AB times AB, which is here. So across the first row and down the first column, gives me the first entry in this matrix. And then likewise, I get the second entry by going across and down the second column, this entry by going across the second row in the first column, this entry going across the second row and the second column. And then I can factor some things out of these entries. So there's an A squared here and an A and an A here. So I can factor an A squared out there. There's an AB here and an AB here. So I can factor AB out there. There's AB here and AB here, so I can factor out there. And then there's B, B here, and B squared there, so I can factor B squared out of those pieces. And each time when I do the factoring, I find that the remaining piece is just an A squared plus B squared piece, but I said I had a unit direction. So those A squareds plus B squareds are one. If I replace them with one, I get this, which is in fact exactly the original matrix A. So what I have proved is that I take A and compose it with itself, that I get nothing other than just the number A, or the, not the number A, rather the matrix A. And this is sort of an interesting uh, equation if you want to think about it. This is a way in which matrix multiplication is starting to act a little bit different. So this is an equation in matrix multiplication that says any projection, its square is just itself. For numbers, that's true for zero and one, but not for any other numbers. And now there are infinitely many projection matrices. So there are infinitely many types of matrices that have this strange algebraic equation. Matrix multiplication is really a very different thing from ordinary number multiplication. And this is, this is a good example of having infinitely many numbers whose, or <laughs> infinitely many matrices whose square is themselves.